Welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. We finished the previous session on a, a bit of a high after finding a few problems. Now, we finished up the last session doing this. Some engraving on this machine, which I never thought I'd ever be able to do, certainly at 600 millimeters a second. So this is quite amazing considering the failure, mm, the disappointment that we had with some of the previous results. The details of how I did this really are for another session when I get back onto this Tangerine Tiger. This was just a diversion that I accidentally discovered as we were hunting through these lens issues. What we're going to do today is take a look back at what we did and ask some rather interesting questions because there's all sorts of logical issues here for me. Because as I said, I've got a degree in optical ignorance. I have only got two remaining grey cells and there's a big gap between them. So sometimes it takes a long time for me to assimilate new knowledge and information. But there's something illogical about what we are seeing here. And I need to get to the bottom of it and try and put a little visual picture in my brain. I'm not good at looking at a big set of formula and saying, oh yes, I can see exactly what that is. I'm not a Stephen Hawking. I work with pictures and I need some simple mechanism that describes what the hell is going on here. Look, when we put this big beam through this lens, the same lens here, on the one hand, it does exactly what we expect it to do. It changes from a very thin line to a thick line as we move it out of focus. And the optimal focal point, and I've shown it here, but it's not really because this is a, this is a lens with some aberration in it like this. And at some point, and that point happens to be here, and it's not this ray focal point, but bear in mind these rays here on the outside are much weaker than those rays down the center in terms of intensity because there is less intensity on the outer part of this beam. That's why it's a conical shape. The intense part of the beam is at the center and the lower intensity part of the beam is on the outside. It's a Gaussian distribution. So these rays out here are doing a lot less damage to this material and they're probably not doing any damage at all here and here, here and here. And it may well be that even as far as here and here, we might only be getting some, mm, some nominal scorching on the outside. We need a certain amount of intensity to do damage to this material at this speed, 25 millimeters a second. If we've got a certain light intensity and a certain exposure time, then we should do some damage to this material. And here we've got nominally 30 watts spread over this area here. Okay, well, to do this amount of damage, point two, it may well be that we're looking at somewhere just here, for example, because that's where the energy concentration amalgamates that we need to damage this material. It's not the size of the beam, it's the intensity of the beam that's actually causing that damage. When we take that same lens and we put this beam through it, it's half the size. From everything that the experts tell me, if I change the beam size, I'm changing the, this thing called energy density and I'm getting all sorts of strange effects come in. That may be fact, I don't know. My brain is incapable of, of absorbing that concept at the moment. Over this zone here, we've got the higher intensity part of the beam. Now, there's only a certain part of this high intensity central part of the beam that's capable of exceeding the damage threshold for this material. And when it exceeds the damage threshold for this material, it produces damage. So the fact that we are seeing the same power, 30 watts, doing a different sort of damage through the same lens with the same beam, but the only difference is the beam is now concentrated. Look, it's a smaller beam. It's gone from 6.5 that we measured across here 
to 5.0. So it's come down by maybe 30, 20, 30 percent. But look at the difference that it's made to the thickness of the line that it's burnt. So let's subtract the constants and see what we're left with. The lens is a constant. The refractive index through this material must remain the same because the light entering is the same. So logically the lens is not the thing that's causing this to happen because it's a constant. Now the thing that will maybe change is the fact that we've got a, a very vague focal point here and we've got a different and maybe more concentrated focal point here because we're putting a smaller, more concentrated beam through the same lens. The lens is not going to change its refractive properties. The beam is the only thing that can be causing this problem. And by that I don't mean the properties of the beam, I mean the intensity of the beam. Over this same zone of high energy, what we've got, we've got a different concentration of the high intensity light in this small zone. We had a range of light, but that range of light was from a much bigger beam. It was more diluted, if you like. I'm suspecting that maybe just the central, very, very central part of that diluted beam here was had enough light intensity to damage here. Whereas with this one, the light intensity is much greater because we start off with a more concentrated beam. So although we might still be only doing damage in this part here, because the intensity of light in this little part is probably twice as much as it is here, it's doing more damage and it's doing it over a wider range. I can see that the concentrated effect of this intensity here, as opposed to the diluted effect of intensity here could be responsible for this different performance. That's what I call a nice simple model that I can visualize. The first thing I'm going to do is see if I can find a focal point of some sort for this lens. Obviously the focal point is not where we thought it should be at around about 50.8. I've got a 20 mil block here plus 15 which makes this 35 and there's approximately 10 the lens inside. So at the moment we're starting off with this at around about 45 millimeter focal point. 50.8 is the nominal focal length. We're seeing no changes in the width of that line. The question we have to ask is why is that line thickness not changing? Well look let's look at this problem from the other way around. Let's stop looking at it from the lens and let's look at it from the material point of view. The material is being damaged by the same amount regardless of the focal distance away from the lens. But if I increase the speed I could try and change the thickness of the line. Because remember this is a Gaussian distribution still and it's got a, an energy peak within that beam. I'm just going to perform a very simple test here to demonstrate what I mean. This is at 50.7, the focal length of the lens. We've got a very, very intense beam. It's so intense that it's burning very deeply into the material. I'm exceeding the damage threshold by a huge factor. We can clearly see that what's going into the lens is a really fantastic Gaussian intensity distribution. The lens is doing something to it. Let's try and investigate what it's doing. So this is 15 millimeters out of the lens. One, two, three, four, five. 20 millimeters, zero. One, two, three, four, five. Obviously it burnt through there in much quicker than five seconds. See the time taken to burn through 25 millimeters as another reference point. Zero, one, two. You saw the spark there when it burnt through and came out the bottom. Zero, one, zero, one, less than one. Well, let's take a look at the results of the test that I've just run. Now this is a 2 inch 50.8 millimeter focal length lens. Now here's what the burn looks like 15 millimeters away from the lens. 
20 millimeters away from the lens. 30 millimeters, 40 millimeters, 50, 60, and 70. And this is what it's like with no lens in at all. So this is in and all these are out at various distances. This one here is 35 millimeters above the focal point. This one here is 20 millimeters below the focal point. And this is at the supposed focal point of the lens. There is a very small difference in the diameter of the beam. But if we look roughly halfway down this penetration, you'll see they're very little different. There's a very good reason why they're different at the top. This one has got a very open conical shape that comes down. This one has got a very short conical shape at the top. And this one has got no conical shape at the top. So the beam at this point is clearly entering with no additional burning powers because it stays constant at the top. It doesn't open up as time progresses. So technically what we see at the top here is a pretty reasonable indication of what the beam diameter is doing. We're not getting a massive concentration here at the focal point as compared to way away from the focal point. But this is a two inch focal length lens. So it should have a very concentrating focusing effect, but it's not. Why not? Now, I love showing these interesting problems because not only is it an interesting problem for me to solve, but it tends to drag in experts from the field of optics. And in this case, those experts tell me that what I'm witnessing here is a diffraction effect. Just the sort of thing I didn't want to hear because I don't understand what diffraction is. I understand what diffraction is as far as photographic work is concerned. The, the smaller the F number, the less detail you can see in your picture. I understand also the, the wave theory of light and the fact that, you know, when you pass light through a slit like this, you get diffraction patterns. That's my understanding of what diffraction is. And in those patterns, well, you can plot the, if you like, the light intensity of those patterns, the wave intensity, and you can see there. You know, I mean, these are look, look very familiar Gaussian distributions. Yeah, I can imagine how people think that this is all to do with the problem that I'm seeing. I, I'm not convinced. I can't see how diffraction is the answer to the problem because we're not passing light through a slit or an aperture. I'm, I'm convinced that this problem all revolves around aberration. Here's a lens with aberration. It's generally not as bad as this, but this is a great way to illustrate the point that I want to make. Question one, can I focus anything through the axis of the lens? Remember, it takes two to tango. You need two rays of light to create a focus. Okay, I know there's likely to be a cone of light, but just in one plane, let's assume that it's two rays of light to create a focus. Now, any ray that happens to be on this axis will disappear to infinity, right through the center of this lens. There will be no focusing taking place on it at all. Let's start moving a few wavelengths of light away from here. Okay, now we've got a ray on either side of the axis. While it's very, very close to this axis, where will those first two rays focus? They will be almost at infinity as well. And it's not until we move a little bit further away from the center that we'll actually start to generate a proper focusing action. So it's my contention that what we're seeing here by way of a big beam is, if you like, a weakness in the design of these lenses. Because they're a spherical design, at this point here, just across the center, there is a flat spot almost where virtually no focus will take place at all. And so basically what comes in goes out. Add to that fact that the most intense part of our beam coincides with this center point. And now we're talking about not only an intense beam, but a very intense beam, which is extremely sharply focused around this center point here. So our intensity 
as disappearing through this lens and hardly being focused at all. And that is my contention as to why the beam is big and stable over a very long distance. It is nothing to do with diffraction and it's all to do with the weakness of the lens design coupled with the strength of the intensity in the laser beam. Put those two things together and they're not good bedfellows. So in, in essence what this has shown me is that we need to stretch this shape very slightly away from this call it a dead zone in the middle, non-focusing zone in the middle to get what we're looking for. So we'll watch this one develop, should we? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Now I've got a set of results here which I think we must really go and have a look at under the microscope because these are done with a compound lens. I'm just calibrating my screen here against a known uh, one millimeter 0.1 increments. So my scale on here is now perfectly matched. So let's just find the thinnest one. I think it might be that one. No, it's that one. And it's around about 0.35 wide. And the black is a very deep center. So let's just compare that to this one. So the damage zone there is about 0 0.5 or 0 0.6 wide. And it's not symmetrical. If it was symmetrical, it would be around about 0.4 which is not much different to the other one. How have I managed to achieve that? I've shown you this technical document before. And one of the things that it mentions in here is the opportunity to correct lens aberration. One of the ways is here, a two or a three compound lens. I just happen to normally use that sort of compound lens, which is a plano convex and a meniscus. I've adopted this approach here to remove all the lens aberration or as much as possible as you can see here. And that's how I've managed to achieve my results. Well, I think I've proved my case. If I remove aberration, I remove the differences between the two machines. This very sharp beam now performs the same as the much softer beam from my other machine. But of course, one of the things about correcting aberration is that I finish up with a very short focal length lens. And a very short focal length lens is not a great deal of use for cutting. It's going to be fantastic for engraving, as I found out last time. I'll have to look at other ways to see if we can reduce the aberration and improve the performance of the machine by different means. One of the different means will be just using a single meniscus lens and as you can see using a positive meniscus lens greatly reduces the amount of aberration it still might not fix it now there are two other options here for correcting spherical aberration that's being suggested one of them is to pass the light through an aperture but of course one of the problems with doing that is that means the aperture itself is going to heat up bad news because i can't get to it to cool it we don't have this opportunity because these lens shapes are just not available to us. Is meniscus lens or a compound lens? I'm now going to try a simple experiment that I think will prove that aberration is the real culprit that we're dealing with here. I've got my 50 millimeter lens set to 50 millimeters. It doesn't matter what it's set to because if you remember with with this configuration I'm going to get a thick line. Now I've mitigated the thickness of the line by dragging the job to the back corner of the machine where I've got a slightly softer beam which we're going to have to play with at some later stage but here's what a 50 millimeter line looks like. I now put a target on there and we'll check that my beam is actually passing down the center of that lens tube. that the beam is passing through a dead spot or a weakness in the lens what we're going to do is we're going to move the beam off that weak spot and I'm going to do that by changing the position that the beam hits the lens so instead of going down the center of the lens now 
I'm going to make it go down quite a long way off centre. Let's just see what I've done to the position of that beam. A good beam width off centre. Without changing anything, let me now run that line test again. Have I made my point? That line is now half the thickness that it was before because I've now got some focus back into that line. Okay, dodgy diagram time. And when the beam hits mirror three and goes right down through the centre of the lens like that and hits the work, we're supposed to be at a focus point there. What I've done, I've changed the beam so that it hits the mirror in a different place. And this time, it's passing through the lens there, not here. So the beam is now working in this zone over here. It doesn't matter that the beam is off center as far as the focus is concerned, because the whole point of a lens is that it takes these rays here and it turns them in towards the focal point, like that. Now, if you were engraving, it wouldn't matter if your beam was offset badly like this, because it would still come to a focal point. That's the whole point of a lens. But in this case, what I've been able to do is to show you, because I'm not working in this dead spot here, I'm working in a different spot around the lens, which I'm approaching at an angle. It's no longer being approached dead 90 degrees with a little bit either side. This is being approached at quite a significant angle on the lens. And so the beam is now able to be focused down to this point. If I try and cut with it, I'd produce a cut like that. But that's not what I'm trying to prove. What I'm trying to prove is here that by moving the lens away from that position, that central position, where I had a wide line like that, I've now moved it and focused the line to a much thinner line. I don't think I can give you a better experiment than that to prove that aberration is the root cause of this problem. I'm beginning to feel very confident now that I'm beginning to decode this problem. We've got a very sharp beam that enters this lens and it looks like this. It's got a very sharp Gaussian distribution. That bit there is escaping through the central part of this lens because just across there it's flat and there's no focusing taking place at that point there even though we've got a very small beam only certain parts of this beam are being focused but the real powerful part of the beam is actually going right the way through and that's the reason why we're getting a wide line. We can see what wide line we're getting from that two inch gallium arsenide lens. Whether we put it this way up or this way up, it makes little or no difference because, hey, the hole is through the middle of that lens regardless of which way we go. I use the word hole in a, a rhetorical manner, a non-effective area of the lens. But I think I'm fairly confident you're going to prove that this theory is reality. I've already given you some demonstrations of why I think it's reality so far, but this will probably be about the final straw. We've got the same sharp beam passing through a different lens. Now this lens is going to be a four inch lens, which has got a completely different curvature on it to the two inch lens. It's flatter. And flatter means to me that I'm going to not just have this little bit here, a flatness, and allow that bit through, but because I've got a much wider flat section, I'm going to be allowing that much through. So I'm going to get a wider, effectively, I've got that much flatness now. So with a four inch lens, I'm going to finish up with a wider line that's going right through the middle of that lens. Now, it will never get to the width of the beam, but it will be a fair proportion of that beam width. So I've got a four inch zinc selenide lens, plano convex, set up inside here. Okay, now it's 44 millimeters from the tip of this nozzle to the face of the lens. 
and it's a 101.6 focal length lens. So 44 to 100 is 56, plus the 1.6, say two millimeters, means I've got to set that gap nominally to 58 millimeters. 16, 17, 18 millimeters. And there we go. So there's our focal point set on the surface of that material. What are we expecting to see? On the basis of these lines here, which are about 0.7, I can't even hazard a guess really. One millimeter, two, two millimeters, 1.5. A bit like a lottery, isn't it? I, I like to guess what's gonna happen. I'm very confident it's not gonna be anything like this. So let's give it a try. Wow! <laughs> I can measure that with my caliper. 1.7 millimeters. I'll tell you what I have got here. Just to further prove the point, I've got a seven and a half inch lens here. This lens is so flat that you can hardly work out which way is which. From here, I can see about three of my LEDs that are underneath here. And if I turn it over, I can only see two. So that's the flat side. And this is the very, very slightly curved side. And because it's almost flat, I'm expecting it to be an even wider line than that. For reference, what I'll do is this. Okay, that is no lens at all. That is the width of the beam. So here's our 190 millimeter focal length lens. 92 millimeters of it is buried up inside the lens tube and nozzle. That means I've got a 98 millimeter gap. And so here it is, 20, 40, 60, 80, plus 18, 98 millimeters. What are we expecting to see this time? Something closer to that, I would suspect. <laughs> there we go. How happy am I? Well, in a strange sort of way, I'm disappointed. But on the other hand, I'm happy that I've discovered the hole in the middle of the lens that I always thought was there from two or three years ago when I was trying to find the mechanism by which lenses cut. I have found the mechanism by which lenses cut, but I've also found the limit that limits how lenses can cut, which is great because now we know what we've got to do. Now, as I've told you guys many times before, this is a very selfish activity that I do here. This is my machine. It's my learning and I'm the person getting the enjoyment from it. You're tagging along for the ride. And if I learn, you learn. If I make mistakes, don't follow them. Now, today has been a bit of a zigzag session. You followed my nose as I've been working my way through decoding this problem. I didn't know where I was going, but I've now finished up with a very very clear vision of what's going on. My two grey cells self-imposed hyperdrive and revealed to me a whole new vision of laser beams and lenses for the future. Something that I didn't even know about half an hour ago. Now, I'm going to share that with you. We have bumpy lenses and we have flat lenses. Let's call that one a two inch lens and let's call that a four inch lens. Now what we've seen is that for a very sharp Gaussian distribution beam that looks like that, that I had visions would be absolutely amazing at cutting because the greater the intensity, the faster the cutting. If you compromise the intensity, you can't cut as fast. My very simple goal on this exercise was to get the beam as intense and sharp as possible. Lenses are just amplifiers. If that lens has got an amplification factor of 100, then if I put that beam through it, it's gonna amplify the intensity by a factor of 100. If I put a much lower intensity beam through it, 
it's going to multiply that by 100. It's not going to be as good at cutting, but it's still going to cut. What we discovered today was that there is a dead spot through that lens where it's ineffective at focusing. On this one, there's a dead spot at the top there. Smaller dead spot that's ineffective at focusing. And the, the larger the curvature on the lens, the less the flat spot or dead non-functional focusing area is. And what we found clearly is that if we put this beam through this lens, then look, up to here matches that dead spot. And that energy, that intensity, will go straight through the middle of there without any focusing at all. And on this one, well, we've got a bigger dead spot. So what will happen is it will allow that much there to pass through. And we should finish up with a bigger, thicker line or dead spot passing through the centre of the lens. I, and I don't know what it is at the moment, but somewhere beside here and here, this dead spot, there is a range over which we will be able to find the opportunity to maximise cutting. If we start going out to here, then what we're doing, we're maximising engraving capability because we're focusing down to a spot. And we don't want to focus down to a spot for cutting. We want to focus down to a spot, but leave this hole. We need to, we need to leave a hole in the, in the surface for this energy to pass through. Now, the only way that we can get this looking like that as if we do this to the beam, if we castrate the beam and make it like that. In other words, it's, it's got no, its intensity level is crap, okay? But it does mean to say that the leakage through the centre of that lens is now almost negligible. You won't notice it, okay? So that all of a sudden becomes an engraving lens because we've got nearly uniform intensity across the lens. Somewhere between there, which is a soft engraving beam, and maybe something like that, which has got an element around it that's high power towards the center. Or that will be a cutting beam. Now, the point being, that profile as a cutting beam or an engraving beam for a four inch lens will be different for a two inch lens for these same reasons. You know, this will require a much smaller area here for cutting. So therefore I should be able to use a much sharper higher intensity beam with a two inch lens for cutting. But I might have to do that for engraving. <sighs> Isn't life complicated? We all thought we understood laser beams and lenses. Well, it turns out that this problem that we're seeing is a mixture of both the lens property and a laser beam property. That's the problem that we've been trying to decode today. I hope you've understood my very crude drawings about what my two grey cells revealed to me less than half an hour ago. I'm very excited at the future because now it means I've got to spend a lot of time playing with beam conditioning, messing around with that expander. And I'm going to try over the next few sessions to see if I can play with the beam expander. I'm waiting for some lenses from China, so I might not be able to do it immediately. But part of this program will be to look at ways of trying to see if I can optimize the beam shape for different lenses. What can I say? I normally try and G up my two gray cells with cups of coffee. Today, I'm gonna to have to go and get a cup of coffee to cool the bloody things down. I think that's enough for today. I really thank you for your time and your patience and I'll catch up with you in the next session.